Welcome back. We're going to continue our discussion of electrical currents in semiconductors. We ended the previous lecture with a very general expression for the electron current and for the whole current. You might wonder what else is there to talk about. Well, when you talk to semiconductor people, they will frequently talk about drift currents and diffusion currents. So the point of this lecture and the next lecture are to talk about the drift current and the diffusion current and relate it to the very general approach that we discussed in the previous lecture. So this lecture is about drift current. This is really the current in an electric field. And there will be some important parameters that we will introduce. One is called the mobility. One is called the conductivity. We actually saw that in the previous lecture. We have a very general expression for the conductivity. We'll have a simpler one in this, in this uh, lecture. And then we'll introduce a quantity called the resistivity. So to begin, let's take a look at a semiconductor in equilibrium. The electrons are bouncing around in random thermal motion. They're getting knocked here and there when they bump into an impurity, when they get knocked by a lattice vibration. No current is flowing, but they're zipping around in random directions with no average velocity. Well, you'll remember from your freshman physics or freshman chemistry that when you have an ideal gas of particles bouncing around in random thermal motion, that the average kinetic energy is 3 halves kT. K is Boltzmann's constant, T is temperature in Kelvin. Now, this is kinetic energy. So the kinetic energy is also 1 half mass times the average velocity squared. So these are two expressions for the average kinetic energy of these particles in random thermal motion. Well, if I equate those two, we can solve for the square root of the average velocity squared. That's the root mean square velocity. And we get this simple expression for the velocity at which these electrons are zipping around in random thermal motion. The lighter the effective mass is, the higher the velocity, the higher the temperature, is the higher the velocity, all of that makes sense. If we were to plug in numbers for typical semiconductors, you'll find that this velocity is roughly 10 to the 7th centimeters per second, which is really quite a high velocity. So electrons are zipping around in random thermal motion. No average current is flowing because there's no average motion in any direction. Well, what if we apply a small voltage to this semiconductor slab. That's going to attract electrons. The positive voltage on, on the contact at the right is going to attract this electron. Electrons will move from the left to the right. They're still bouncing around in random thermal motion. But now there's a small additional component imposed upon that that's going to move them slowly from the left to the right. So the electrons, we'll say the electrons drift in the electric field, and the average velocity at which they're moving from the left to the right is called the drift velocity. And our question is, what current flows through this semiconductor device under these conditions? Well, we remember that the definition of current is charge divided by time. How much charge is in the semiconductor? How much time does it take to flow out of the semiconductor? Um, the minus sign here is just due to the fact that we're defining current to be positive when it flows in to contact two. Well, how much charge is in the semiconductor? Well, there's a Q magnitude of the charge on an electron. There's a little n, the electron density per cubic centimeter. And the volume of the semiconductor is the cross-sectional area A times the length of the semiconductor. And the charge is negative because these are negatively charged electrons. So that's the total charge Q. How long does it take for that charge to move out of the semiconducting slab? Well, it's the length of the slab divided by the average velocity at which these electrons are moving across this semiconductor bar. That's called the transit time, T sub T. So the current is just minus Q divided by transit time. We get a very simple expression for the current. Makes a lot of sense. The more electrons we have in the slab, the higher the current. The faster they're moving across the slab, 
the higher the current, the bigger the cross-sectional area. The more electrons are flowing in parallel, the higher the current. So we have that very simple expression. Since cross-sectional area is arbitrary, we like to write it in terms of current density. So we have a simple expression for the current density in this semiconducting slab. If I had holes here, I'd have a positive charge. Everything would look the same, except I would have a positive sign instead of a negative sign, and I'd have an average velocity at which the holes were drifting to replace the average velocity that electrons are drifting. So we have two simple expressions for the drift current due to this average motion in the electric field. Okay. But we want to relate this to the electric field or to the actual voltage that's across this device. So how do we relate the velocity to the electric field? Well, if we go back to our freshman physics and Newton's laws, we remember that force is mass times acceleration, or we could also write force as dp dt, where p is the momentum of the particle. And we could then solve a problem if we put a force on the particle. We could find the velocity as a function of time, the position as a function of time, the momentum as a function of time. Since we're in a semiconductor, we simply replace the actual mass by the effective mass, and then we can use Newton's laws. So let's do that. Let's say we have an electric field pointing in the positive x direction from the left to the right. Um, there's going to be a force on electrons from the right to the left because we have a negative charge. The force on electrons is minus Q times the electric field. If we write Newton's laws, we would say that the time rate of change of momentum is equal to the force on the electrons. But what's this additional term? That's a negative term. Well, that's like friction. That slows the electron down. That takes momentum away. And the easiest way to write this is just to write it as minus momentum divided by a characteristic time tau sub m we call the momentum relaxation time. So on average, the electrons, this is the time it takes for the electron to lose all of that momentum by scattering processes that randomize its velocity. So the first term is due to the force on the electric field. The second term is due to the frictional forces due to scattering of the electron. Okay, so the force comes from the electric field. We'll put the electric field in there. And then we can ask after the initial acceleration, which is very quick, what's the steady state velocity? We'll set dp dt equal to zero, solve this equation, and we have an equation for the steady state momentum, which is mass times the steady state velocity. Bottom line of this simple exercise is that the drift velocity is proportional to the electric field and we know what the constants of proportionality are. We'll lump all of those constants together into a very important parameter for semiconductor materials and devices called the electron mobility. So the velocity is minus mobility times electric field. The minus sign comes from the minus charge, negative charge on the electron. And mu is called the electron mobility and you can see that it's given by Q tau over M. So we have a simple expression for the drift velocity, and we've introduced these important, this important parameter, the electron mobility. Well, let's take a look at this. So we have expressions for the electron drift velocity proportional to the electric field. Same thing would apply for holes, the holes would would drift in the opposite direction because they have a positive charge. Um, the mobilities are something that are well known and have been measured carefully in silicon. We have an electron mobility that is a little more than uh, two, two to three times higher than the whole mobility in pure silicon at room temperature. If we assume a modest you know, electric field, say 100 volts per centimeter, you know, you know, so consider you know, two plates a centimeter apart. We apply 100 volts across those. Actually, not so modest. Um, if we plug numbers in, 
we'll find that the electron drift velocity is about 1.4 times 10 to the fifth centimeters per second. The whole drift velocity is about 0.5 times 10 to the fifth centimeters per second. Each of those is actually about a hundred times smaller than this RMS thermal velocity. Remember, the electrons are zipping around in random thermal motion at about 10 to the seventh centimeters per second. So, the bottom line is that drift velocities are much lower than the thermal velocity. So, the picture is this. We have this slab of semiconductor. We have the electrons in it zipping around at random thermal motion at 10 to the seventh centimeters per second roughly, depends exactly on the effective mass of the semiconductor. But, there are, but if there's a voltage applied across this, then superimposed on that very high random velocity is a small average velocity that causes electrons to drift from the left to the right. At an average velocity, we call the drift velocity, and the drift velocity is proportional to the electric field, but it's typically at least for small or modest electric fields, it's much smaller than the thermal velocity. So we have these drift current equations. Remember, we deduced the current equations. The electron and hole currents were proportional to the electron and hole densities and to the drift velocities. The drift velocities are proportional to the electric field. Related, the constant of proportionality is the mobility for holes and electrons. So if we put those two together, we get these very important equations. These, are, these equations describe the drift currents in a semiconductor, the currents due to the presence of an electric field. Now, a very important parameter, the higher the mobility, the higher the drift velocity, the higher the current. So the mobility is a key parameter in a semiconductor device. Uh, these plots show the measured mobility of electrons and holes in a semiconductor silicon at room temperature as a function for how heavily we've doped it. You know, down here is the pure silicon, the 1380 and the 1360, I believe, and 480 centimeters squared per volt second that I mentioned on the previous slide. But you can see that as we dope the semiconductor, more and more. We don't just get more and more electrons, we actually lower their mobility at the same time. Well, what's going on there? What's going on there is something called ionized impurity scattering. So the impurities do more than simply donate an electron to the conduction band or a hole to the valence band. They introduce a charged defect in the semiconductor. So that now when one of those electrons moves near this charged impurity, it will be deflected. And the velocity in the x direction can be lowered by this deflection. So this is called ionized impurity scattering. The more impurities we put in, the more chance that these electrons will encounter a charged impurity and be deflected. And that's a scattering event that lowers the scattering time and that lowers the mobility. Well, there are other ways that the electron can be scattered. This is our cartoon of a silicon lattice at t equals zero. We have each of these atoms uh, in a particular location in the crystal lattice. But at finite temperatures, they have a kinetic energy, three halves kT. They're bouncing around in random thermal motion. So their locations are not precise. They're bouncing around in random thermal motion. And the lattice itself can change, can interact with the electron, that's called the electron-phonon interaction, and can knock the electrons in random thermal motions. And as you can guess, the higher the temperature, the more the electrons are vibrating, and the stronger this scattering due to the lattice vibrations is. Now, in general, if you measure mobility versus temperature, we'll get a plot that looks something like this. Initially, the mobility increases in simple semiconductors as t to the 3 halves. At low temperatures, the lattice vibrations are very small. They're not important. What's important are ionized impurity scattering events. And as we increase the temperature, the thermal velocity increases. So the electrons zip past those charged impurities more rapidly. They're deflected less. 
and that means that the mobility is higher as we increase the temperature. As we get to very high temperatures, the mobility starts to drop. It starts to drop because we're getting more and more lattice vibrations. They're becoming dominant. The stronger the lattice vibrations are, the more they knock electrons around, and the lower the mobility is. So we get this characteristic shape. The increasing mobility at low temperatures will suggest the presence of charge impurity scattering. So if you measure a characteristic like that, that's what you deduce. The decreasing mobility at high temperatures suggests the presence of lattice scattering. So if you measure that characteristic, you'll infer that I'm dominated by lattice scattering. Now, in general, you're at a temperature where both of these effects are important. How do you account for both of them? Well, what we do is we, we uh, account for both of them by, by summing the inverse mobilities. Um, one over the total mobility due to both mechanisms is one over the mobility if we only had ionized impurity scattering, plus one over the mobility if we only had lattice scattering. So you can see if one of them is unimportant, unimportant we would have a very high mobility uh, and it would drop out and we would be dominated by the one that would give us the lower of the two mobilities. This is called Mathiasen's rule and it's in general a pretty good way for combining the effects of different scattering mechanisms. Okay, um, so just to recap here, if we were to take a semiconductor and if we were to measure the average velocity versus electric field, for silicon, we would see a characteristic that would look like this. We would see that the average velocity was proportional to the electric field if the electric field was small enough. But if we applied a large enough electric field, we would see that the velocity would saturate at about 10 to the seventh centimeters per second. That just happens to be about what the thermal velocity is um, at that at these high electric fields, the electrons gain a lot of kinetic energy. They scatter a lot. There are a lot more ways for them to bounce around and scatter, and you just can't push them to even higher velocities. So this is called velocity saturation, and it occurs when we get to very high electric fields. Now, other semiconductors can, can display some distinctly different characteristics. At low electric fields, the velocity is still proportional to the electric field. In gallium arsenide, the effective mass is very light. The velocities can be quite high. But you can see that as I go to high electric fields, something happens. Uh, the electric, the uh, mobility reduces, the velocities drop down to roughly 10 to the seventh centimeters per second. Uh, again. So you might wonder, what is this curious complex behavior in gallium arsenide all about? Um, well, we'll explain that in a minute, but first of all, I'll just remind you that what we have been talking about up until this point is called near equilibrium or linear transport. Uh, when the electric field is small, when the velocities are proportional to the electric field. There is also, when the electric fields are high, uh, that's high field transport. The electrons have a lot of kinetic energy. So if we measure that kinetic energy as 3 halves kT, their temperature is hot. We call that hot carrier transport. And that in general gets more complex. Well, what causes this unusual behavior for gallium arsenide? Uh, well, that unusual behavior we can understand if we look at the band structure for gallium arsenide. So in gallium arsenide, we have a direct band gap semiconductor with a very light effective mass for electrons. But we also have these satellite valleys that have higher effective masses. So an electric field that's strong enough can move an electron way above the bottom of the conduction band. And we can move up to an energy where a scattering event now can move it over to one of these valleys where there is a much heavier effective mass there are many more ways to scatter among the different valleys, so the mobility drops. So initially, the mobility is high when we're, the electron is in the central valley where the effective mass is low. When we give them enough energy that they can scatter to these upper valleys where the effective mass is low, uh, effective mass is high, I'm sorry, and the scattering is stronger, 
then the velocity plummets. And that explains that unusual characteristic that can actually be exploited to build microwave oscillators. Okay, so just to summarize, we have expressions for the drift currents. We can lump n, q, mu together and recognize that as the conductivity of the semiconductor. Um, conductivity, you can work out the units and convince yourself that the units are Siemens per meter um, or Siemens per centimeter would usually be quoted for. We have similar things going on for holes as well. Okay. Now, in general, we'll have both electron current and hole current in the semiconductor. So if we want the total current, we simply add the electron current and the hole current. Or add the conductivities, and the total conductivity is the sum of the electron conductivity and the hole conductivity. So we can write the total current as total conductivity times electric field. Now, we might also solve that equation for the electric field. The electric field would be 1 over conductivity times the current density. And 1 over conductivity has a name. It's called the resistivity. So it's simply 1 over the conductivity of a material. Uh, so it would be 1 over nq mu plus pq mu. Resistivity and conductivity, same parameter. One is the inverse of the other. So resistivity is something that people frequently measure. Here you can see a plot of resistivity uh, versus doping density for electrons and holes in silicon. Um, if we take a look at this, you'll see that the resistivity does not just drop linearly as we increase the number of dopants. It has a shape that is due to the fact that it's higher than you might have expected because when we dope it more heavily, we lower the mobility. But again, these are well-known, well-characterized materials. If we need the resistivity of silicon at a particular doping density, we can look it up. So now we can introduce our first semiconductor device, the resistor. So the question is, what is the current flow through this device, this resistor? We begin with our current equation. We want the current itself, not the current density, so we multiply by the cross-sectional area. Um, we can recognize that the electric field is voltage divided by the di distance between the two contacts, voltage divided by length. So we can lump these parameters together. We get current is proportional to voltage. The quantities in the parentheses are the conductance, or 1 over the resistance. And we have a simple expression for the resistance. Uh, the resistance of, the semi of this slab is resistivity, 1 over the conductivity, times length divided by cross-sectional area. Makes a lot of sense. The more resistive the material is, the higher its resistivity, the higher the resistance of our resistor. The longer it is, the harder it is for current to flow across, the higher the resistance. The fatter it is, the bigger the cross-sectional area, and that's like adding resistors in parallel. There are more parallel paths for the current to flow, so the resistance is lowered. So that's the IV characteristic of our simple semiconductor device. So we've said everything that we need to say about drift current, except for one thing. What does this all have to do with the previous lecture? We, in the previous lecture, we presented a very general expression for current. And now we seem to be talking about a different way that current can flow. Well, not really. So let's take that general expression. What's important in that general expression are gradients of the quasi-Fermi level. Remember that the quasi-Fermi level is analogous to the Fermi level. So we can write it in terms of the electron density. We can solve that equation for the quasi-Fermi level, take its gradient, and see what happens. Well, let's do that. We'll take our equation, we'll solve for the quasi-Fermi level, we'll take its slope. We're assuming here that the electron density is constant, spatially uniform and independent. So when we take the derivative, we're just taking the derivative of the bottom of the conduction band. Okay. Well, the bottom of the conduction band moves up and down as the voltage moves up and down. A positive voltage lowers the bottom of the conduction band. So when I take the slope, 
I'm really just taking the gradient of the electrostatic potential minus the gradient of the electrostatic potential is the definition of the electric field. So we conclude that the gradient of the quasi-Fermi potential, quasi-Fermi level divided by Q, is simply the electric field. That's a very important point because that shows us that what has really happened here is that we've taken our general expression for current flow, we've examined it under a condition where the electron density is constant, and we found that it reduces to the drift current. It's just proportional to the electric field. So the drift current is a special case of the more general current equation. But if there are gradients in the carrier density, they can also cause current to flow. And that's what we'll talk about in the next lecture.